This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with, uh, with Ian Morris, who is a professor of classics at Stanford University, um, also affiliated with archaeology. I think you've been an historian, as you'll see from the discussion of your books. You've got a little bit of smattering of, uh, of biology <laughs> and, and uh, sociology and um, certainly geography. Um, and he's written a numerous books. I've only got a small set of the subset of them here. Um, perhaps the, the most well-known is this one, Why the West Rules for Now, the Patterns of History and What They Reveal About the Future. Uh, some other books where you've articulated um, and gone into more detail some of the arguments in that book. This one's called uh, The Measure of Civilization, How Social Development Decides the Fate of Nations. This one uh, is a, the Tanner Lectures at Princeton compiled into a book called Foragers, Farmers, and Fossil Fuels, How Human Values Evolve. There's another one called War, What's It Good For? And the most recent one, uh, Geography is Destiny, which is a uh, history of, of England or the British islands uh, over the last 10,000 years. Now, look, these, this is big history. Um, you know, big history, it's, it's I mean, in, in academic circles, big history isn't super fashionable, but uh, there does seem to be uh, a demand for for big history, maybe more so outside the academy than than inside the academy, and and I think in part because it's it's hard. I mean, not only are you covering a, a massive um, time period, but you're also covering a lot of different disciplines. Um, at one point in one of your books, you talk about uh, how. In order to really understand or explain the past, uh, you have to do something that's that's interdisciplinary and not simply uh, multidisciplinary. And so, there's a lot we can talk about. Um, but, but I guess first, I mean, what attracts you to these big time scales and these super super big questions like, you know, why the West, right? <laughs> or, you know, uh, where do human values come from? I mean, these these are the kinds of questions that you certainly can't get a get a PhD asking these kinds of questions. Yeah, no, that's very true. I mean, and you were right when you say that big history on the whole, it's not taken as seriously within university history departments as as little history is. And I think you know, there, there, there is a reason for that, um, that uh, you know, if you want to ask que you know, global scale questions um, affecting the whole of the human experience across thousands of years, you can't do what um, academic historians have learned to do over the last 200 years. Like about 200 years ago, we had this breakthrough in Germany when they figured, ah, you know, the way to solve problems is you go into the archives and you read um, absolutely everything there is to read about your question. And you go to the absolute bottom of the well and get everything. And if your question is too big for you to read everything that can be read on it, then get a smaller question. And that's the only way that you can have real scientific history, once you've read everything and thought about everything that's relevant. And yeah, you, you've got to admire that, because of course they're right about this. This is what makes the difference between modern history writing and the sort of more amateurish old-fashioned versions from the 17th, 16th century. But of course the problem with the bottom of the well approach well it's a silo approach you, know, you you get down to the bottom of the world you can't see very much anymore so i mean i drifted toward the big history stuff because i started off as a reasonably respectable uh, kind of historian and archaeologist and i drifted toward the big history stuff gradually kind of going back all the way to when as a graduate student and i realized pretty early on in my phd that if i i was looking at the, the city of athens between about 800 and 600 bc and i realized well if i open it up a little bit and look at a slightly bigger area of greece over a slightly longer time period 500 years now all these new things in my athenian evidence start to become clear to me and then if we make it a bit bigger still look at like southern italy as well ah new stuff the near east even more new stuff and so this sort of carried on getting more and more out of control until finally about 15 years ago it dawned on me you know i'm now kind of thinking about things on the global scale but i'm no longer really doing that in order to cast light on a small history question it's like the the big history background has become more interesting to me than the questions i was originally setting out to answer so you know why why kid myself i, I would just embrace this thing i uh, admit that i'm a very superficial person and want to look at a lot of things in a very shallow way and i'll just do that from now on well, I mean, it seems like in science you need both uh, kind of the specialists and and the generalists. I mean, I'm always thinking of Francis Bacon's 
uh, description of the scientists, right? You know, you need to have the, the ants and you need to have the, the bees and you need to have the spiders, right? And you need to kind of have all of them in, in order for the, for the field to, to progress, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think scientists have been a lot better at this than humanists. I think mean, natural scientists better at it than social scientists too. Uh, maybe partly because natural scientists have just been doing it for longer. But yeah, they're they're very good at these you know, multi-specialist collaborative teams and labs um, where you usually you've got somebody who really is in charge of the lab. But um, still, a lot of people with this sort of functionally specialized jobs doing all these different bits. And to some extent, I mean, I I do do that sort of thing. A little bit um, in that I, in the past at least I was very active in field archaeology and directing projects where um, it's like you know, to, to run a modern excavation as director you need to know a little bit about soil science and a little bit about botany and a little bit about zoology you need to know enough that you can talk to specialists about it and ask them sensible meaningful questions that there's a chance of answering at your site but you're not expected to be a botanist yourself i'm not expected to, to to be a soil scientist and so it's like you're the impresario conducting this orchestra and you take these people on to do everybody does their own job and then at the end of the project you produce this big multi-authored website or report and I think in the humanities, we've been much less good at that. I think that's partly from just the scholarly traditions in the area, but also you know, because of what we're trying to do. That, like, say, if somebody like Jared Diamond writes Guns, Gems and Steel, he didn't convene a committee of 25 specialists who would each write their report and then they sit there for days and days till they reach consensus. No, he, he sat down, he imposed his vision on the history of the world, and that's what makes it such a great book. So I think that you know, there is a problem for this sort of big history with... Um, doing the multi-authored kind of thing but i think we, we do have to get better at at least grounding it in lots of specialists mm -hmm. doing their own thing now now economic historians are always interested in um you know what what causes economic progress and, and they define economic progress as um output per capita right or you know some proxy for for gdp you use sort of a a, a different metric and, and i think you know you know this metric is certainly correlated with with output per per capita, but but it's it's grounded in in technologies, right? Technologies of production, and and you have a couple different kind of factors that go into this this metric, the one that you used in why the West rules. But the the one that's that's most important is this idea of of energy capture. So I was wondering, I mean, how how did how did you come to think of this as probably the most important? way to to capture what we might think of as 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 development and i mean even this term development it it sort of implies some kind of notion of of, of progress doesn't it i mean it's 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 it assumes that the further along you are <laughs> along this this uh this process sort of the i guess the you know the better or the the more developed the the wealthier right and and um so i mean where did you how did you come to this notion that that um energy capture was the the key metric that you wanted to focus on yeah well archaeologists for a long time archaeologists have been interested in developing um numerical tools for measuring well, actually, what they're trying to measure, that's not always entirely clear. We have a lot of arguments about what, what should we be measuring here? But it's some sense of, you know, you compare modern post-industrial societies with like medieval societies or ancient ones, or even more so with um, prehistoric hunter-gatherer societies. The scale has changed so dramatically. Um, the sophistication of the intellectual tools we've got, just you know, everything is bigger. I mean, whether it's better is another thing entirely, but it's certainly bigger and, and more complex and put together in more integrated ways. And so archaeologists for a long time have been interested in trying to find um, standardized tools for measuring this and comparing across civilizations and across time. And um, these tools, it goes in and out of fashion trying to do this. And one of the main reasons I think it's been unfashionable lately is that attempting to put together this one size fits all tool that will measure everything you need to know about all the societies in the past what you often end up with is the same kind of problem that 19th century evolutionists got into is that by trying to explain everything at once you don't really end up explaining anything and so i've always been a big believer that uh, quantitative tools are really, really useful, but also that the kind of tool you need depends on the kind of question you're asking. 
And so I, I wrote this book, came out in 2010, Why the West Rules for Now. And uh, there was a lot of argument going on back then between people who were saying, oh, well, the, the West came to dominate the planet because Western is just like better than everybody else. And they always have been. And other people would say, no, 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 not like that at all. Um, Western domination of the planet is a very recent thing. It's probably a short term thing. All societies are basically the same or maybe Eastern societies are in fact better or something. Um, and so I wanted to say, can we get all the arguing parties kind of on the same page here. And one way to do this, I thought, would be by having some way of measuring the development of these societies across the very, very long run. And then if we can agree what those patterns are, then we can sit down and have a sort of grown up discussion about what, what is causing these patterns, where they might go next. And when I phrased a question like that, it just... It just seemed very obvious right from the get-go that um, the capture of energy was going to be the basis that everything else was built on. But um, this Western domination question, uh, you know, it's fueled by the West's ability to and you develop complex scientific methods and build ships and you know, all sorts of things that um, the West does in the 19th century. But all of that is ultimately made possible by uh, rising energy capture. So, but but this this de this 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 development uh, metric that you put together i mean is this meant to be um is this meant to be a measure of the thing that needs to be explained or is this meant to be the measure of the the explanation right for um progress and economic development yeah, I mean, the social development index was, was meant to be a way to measure what needs to be explained if you're going to understand why the West um, mm -hmm. came to dominate the world in the last couple of hundred years. And so, and, and of course, all these things ultimately come down to how you define the terms that go into them. And so I use development just to mean the uh, the ability of societies to kind of get what they wanted from the world, to impose their wills on the world. And it seemed to me uh, there was a number of different dimensions to this. And um, your ability to capture energy from the environment, this was really the foundation that everything else is built on. And then, because uh, what, what complicates the story is that there's varying levels of efficiency in using the energy that you've captured, um, skill of inventing new ways to apply the energy that you've captured. Um, but yeah, this is a tool for measuring what needs to be explained. And uh, I felt that if you know, the West had kind of always been the dominant area of the world, this should show up in the development scores going back into very distant times. If, in fact, it's a more complicated pattern in different regions of dominant at different periods, that, again, that should show up in the development scores. So, yeah, I spent a long time putting together my index, had a lot of fun doing it, but then needed to write the book explaining why we got the result that we did. Right. So, so you, this, this development index is meant to measure the capacity for humans to, I think you said, get things done, right. <laughs> you know, to uh, accomplish their, their goals. Presumably it's, it's about conquering nature to some extent, but mm -hmm. you, 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 you kind of make it a little bit more complicated. You, you borrow this formula where um, it's energy times technology, right? So you, you, you add in a few other things besides an energy capture um, because presumably that doesn't track in, in, you know, as perfectly, um, with, with the other things you're, you're looking at. Um, you know, one of the th fun facts that I saw in one of the books was that the American farmer puts 80 times the amount of energy into an acre of land as say a, um, early farmer, but, but it gives four times the, the output. So, I mean, it, it seems like that energy index doesn't necessarily correlate one to one with kind of the, the things that we value. I mean, yeah, is, yeah, is, is yeah. How, why, so do you need to refine? How did you? Yeah, well, the, the, the interactions between the different things going on. It's kind of a. It's they're non-linear, um, and so. Uh, yeah. You basically you get declining returns to the amount of energy that you're investing in a, a given unit of land. I mean, which should not surprise an economist all that much. Um, and of course, investing eighty times as much energy in order to get four times as much food out of an acre of land as, say, a, you know, a Near Eastern wheat farmer five thousand years ago. That sounds like a bad investment, but actually, that's a really good investment. Um, because if you need to eat that food, then and you have a way of generating that much energy. Of course, we've got all 
all this energy because we have the ability to turn fossil fuels into energy to do things we want. If you can have the access to the energy, being able to squeeze four times as much food out of the land, this is a miracle. I mean, nothing in our world would be possible if we hadn't done that. This is what, I mean, maybe not you know, breaks the Malthusian curse, but at least you know, pushes the Malthusian frontier back out there into the distance. So yeah, this is the fact that we have managed to turn oil into bread. Wow, this is an amazing thing that humanity has done. Mm -hmm. Well, when you went back and you, you looked at this index uh, over the last couple millennia, you know, you, you you talk about a couple of sort of hard ceilings, right? Mm -hmm. So we 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 bumped up against these these ceilings re repeatedly until there was some kind of of, of breakthrough. And I guess the, the first big breakthrough was the invention of agriculture. And, and I think you referenced Marshall Salins, who said, you know, this was, this was, this was a really bad idea. <laughs> I mean, um, and I, of course, I never, I never really uh, accept, bought that because it was not something that, you know, humanity got together and decided on. Yes. But, um, but what was the, why did settled agriculture allow us to capture more energy? Yeah, I, uh, if you're a hunter-gatherer, I mean, you get your food by hunting wild animals and gathering wild plants. And this is not a very efficient way of extracting energy from the world. I mean, you've got most hunter-gatherers have to move around quite a lot. Um, it's difficult to maintain any large community. Um, it's difficult to just, just kill enough animals and find enough plants to keep uh, any kind of large-scale community growing. And so, um, Agriculture, you know, in order, if people are not going to switch over to agriculture unless it allows them to squeeze more energy out of the world around them. So by domesticating plants, um, learning to use animal manure to fertilize your fields, generate higher yields, you get a lot more energy out of the world, but almost always at the cost of expending more energy to get it. And again, you know, it's a cost benefit analysis. People don't go down the agricultural path unless they convince themselves that, um, expending all that extra energy is worth it in the end for the energy you get back from the world. But the, you know, this is why Salins said that it was a, a terrible idea because it shackled us. And I think in a lot of ways you can sort of write about this. It shackled us into these rhythms of work and the scale of work that a lot of hunter-gatherer groups don't, um, don't get trapped in. But when we're looking at sort of the idyllic hunter-gatherer who, who doesn't actually work all that much, right? Who spends just a couple hours a day hunting and, and gathering and the rest of the time hanging out around the campfire. I mean, th this is not the, the marginal hunter gatherer, right? This is, this is infra marginal, right? This is presumably uh, before they start running up against, uh, you know, population density constraints and so forth. Right. So it, it, it's, it's kind of a, a false uh, comparison right? yes. <laughs> that, yes. that, that people are making when they, yeah, I mean, when, when Salins and other anthropologists in the 1960s started making these arguments about uh, what, what Salins called the original affluent society, the, the hunter-gatherers, um, they, they were the first people who really put this on the table as a research question. And so there's a lot of stuff people didn't know at that point because they hadn't asked the question. And so in the 60 years since then, a lot of new information has come out. And so you know, while on the whole, the, the sort of figures Silence was throwing around for the number of hours people worked and so on, these were sort of in, in the right ballpark. We now know there's often a reason why they don't work all that hard in certain climates. One is, like, say, um, the, the Kung hunter-gatherers in Southern Africa, one of the most studied um, uh, hunter-gatherer communities. Uh, a lot of parts of the year, uh, it's really hot in the Kalahari Desert. And the energy you would expend working through the hottest part of the day is much more than the energy you could conceivably capture back. So, you know, working eight hours a day is a fast way to kill yourself. And there's a lot of detail that once people started looking at them, started to, to come out. And, and with the idyllic part of the story, you know, what got glossed over a little bit in the original affluent society kind of literature was that people will go through, almost all hunter-gatherer groups will go through periods of the year when it's very difficult to sustain themselves. And so they, you know, compared to modern people, they tend to be very short, very malnourished, um, have pretty wretched health in a lot of ways. So yeah, it's not a straightforward comparison. 
and between this wonderful prehistoric way of life and this horrible modern way we've got now that allows us to live into our 80s and keep our teeth in our heads and be able to hear mm -hmm. and all these sorts of things. You know, there's, a, there's a little bit more going on with the comparison here. And particularly, like you say, it's not like we ever really made a choice on this. Um, people do what seems to be working. And eventually you get to a point where um, you shifted little by little um, toward planting um, the plants that you want rather than letting them grow for themselves and wandering around the countryside getting them. More and more you've shifted toward particular gardens that you've manured, you've sunk all this energy and labour and your, your prosperity has gone into them, suddenly deciding, oh, I'm going to hunt and gather now. That just is no longer an option. Mm -hmm. And even if you did decide that, everyone around you is farming now. There are no wild animals left to hunt. There's pretty much nothing left in the forest to find. So, yeah, the, 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 I think this is one of the big questions in doing big history. To what extent is it actually guided by human choice? Or is, are we really talking about much deeper forces? Yeah, well, I think you, ha you introduced the, the Morris theorem, which is that change is basically made by lazy, greedy, uh, frightened people <laughs> who don't really know what, what they're doing. I mean, that, that's consistent with the notion of kind of blind evolution, right? Where, you know, once they stumble on something that works, it presumably would, would diffuse. But, but it seems like most of the innovations that you talk about, at least up until the, the modern period, they, they seem to evolve independently, right? So, you know, you focus on, on the East versus the West. Basically, you focus on the world that includes Europe and the Middle East versus the, the world that, that's centered on, on China. And, uh, and, and they seem to have, have stumbled on their big innovations independently, but they were kind of running neck and neck until, until the modern era. Um, so the, I think the key issue that the, the economic historians are interested in is why why Europe? And uh, and you say it, it has to do with with geography. You know, mm -hmm. I, I talked to um, Joel Mokir recently, who, who emphasized science, and uh, it, you know, and of course, if you push back and say, well, why you know why science in in Europe? Um, there's there's also a geographical <laughs> explanation. Mm -hmm. So so what is the the geographical explanation? And you, you know, to what extent was it uh, indeed? inevitable or at what point did it become inevitable you, in the, towards the end of the book you, you you go back further and further in time and say there, there's there's a point where it wasn't inevitable but there was a point where it became inevitable yeah yeah um so I, I lost my train of thought for a second there so uh, let me just backtrack for a moment um so, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things that struck me very much looking at the long term history was how similar the processes of development were in the Western, uh, originally sort of Mediterranean kind of world and, and the Eastern Chinese world, that they went through a lot of the same stages at sort of roughly the same pace and speed. And I just came, came to the conclusion that. What this illustrated is the simple fact that people are pretty much all the same. All over the world, people are pretty much all the same. Uh, in the sense of, say, large groups of people are pretty much all the same. You'll get about the same proportions of selfish, mean-spirited ones and the same proportions of generous, kind ones and hardworking ones and lazy ones. Same proportion wherever you look around the world. And the culture does inflect these biological forces, but it's the biology that's really in the driving seat here. So we yeah, we shouldn't be terribly surprised that Eastern and Western civilizations did develop in rather similar ways, nor though I think should we be surprised that they sort of ended up in rather different places. Because of course they, they are developing in different places where the geographical forces work differently. And uh, for all sorts of complicated reasons, um, through most of what uh, in the West we call the Middle Ages, China is the most developed part of the world, has the most sophisticated technology and science and mm -hmm. literature, um, travel, all kinds of stuff like this. Um, Europe is very much a laggard through most of the Middle Ages. But um, Europe, uh, the, the Chinese innovations tend to spread out over large areas. So Chinese invent the gun, and the gun gets picked up in the Middle East, and then Europeans learn about guns. Chinese invent ocean-going ships, and a lot of these technologies diffuse outwards. So Europeans are constantly picking up these technologies, uh, usually a few hundred years behind the Chinese. But the big geographical difference is... Um, 
China, you get in the boat and start sailing um, outward out into the ocean from China. You're in the Pacific Ocean, which is like, just really, really big. And you've got to cross uh, with the winds mm-hmm. and tides you need to use. You've got to cross a good 8,000 miles of Pacific before you would discover the Americas. And eventually the Chinese were going to discover the Americas. This was almost certain to happen. But in Europe, you've only got to cover about 3,000 miles before you bump into the Americas. And famously, Columbus wasn't looking for America. He was trying to get to China because that was where all the money was. He was looking for shortcuts by sailing west to get east. And he bumps into the Americas. But um, by the, during the 16th century, the Europeans, of course, realize there's this whole new continent there. And they begin to develop a series of economic systems drawing the wealth of the Americas into a European based economies. And this is what changes the world more than anything has done, I would say, since the beginning of agriculture. The fact that the Europeans, because of geography, are the first ones to discover and start conquering and colonizing and exploiting the Americas. Chinese. As I said, would have got to that point, but it would have taken them much longer because the distances are so much greater. And once the Europeans start doing this, all kinds of new questions start being thrust onto them. They say, well, wow, you know, Look, we were able to do all this because we we're able to cross the Atlantic Ocean. We we're able to sail by the stars and we can master the winds and tides. But just imagine what it would be like if we really understood how the winds and the tides worked and the stars move in the heaven and what the fundamental principles are. And Chinese scientists are asking these questions, too, as are Indian ones and Arabic ones all over the world. People are asking these questions, but they have a level of urgency in Europe that they just don't have anywhere else. And that I would say that's why Europeans have a scientific revolution before anybody else. does. Not because they are innately more scientific, but because the incentives to answering those questions are so much higher. So Europeans have bigger rewards for being like Galileo and figuring out um, the, the, the secrets of the universe are written in the book of nature in the language of numbers, as Galileo says. Chinese would have figured that out too, but Europeans do at first, because geography thrusts these new questions on them. And that, I think, is kind of the secret of world history. Uh, we all Our history is driven by the questions that geography forces onto us. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you look at that index, I mean, I think it's from, what, 600 AD up until about 1400 AD that, that the the East was ahead of the West in terms of the and so if you if you went back in time, if you were Marco Polo, I mean, and you had to place your bets, I mean, you'd place your bets on the East, right? And even if you, you know, went ahead and, and, and read, you know, your book on fossil fuels, you'd say, oh, well, you know, China's ahead there too. I mean, they, they were using coal, right? Yeah. They even had a, a primitive steam engine to open the, 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 the doors to the temple, right? So, so you know, they already had um, made headway uh capturing the energy that was packed into the the fossil fossil fuels that would enable them to escape past you know human and and animal muscle power so 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 i mean is is it that the the technological development was was stymied by this lack of urgency that you're describing and Mm -hmm. and if so well what was why why wasn't china i mean maybe they couldn't go across the Pacific, but wouldn't they be motivated to go to India or, you know, you, you have, you start off the book with this, 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 this great uh, hypothetical where, where the Chinese send a junk to, to, to London and uh, ab- abduct Prince Albert <laughs> and bring him back to, to China, which, which is really the flip side of what the British did in the, in the mm-hmm. opium yeah. wars more or less. Right. So, so, you know, why, why is it geography then that that drove this this sense of of urgency? I think you said each age gets the thought that it needs. Why did yes. Europe need it so badly? Yeah, well, I think I mean, go, going back to a point you raised earlier, I think when we um, trace social development over many thousands of years, what we see is you know, generally speaking, if you sort of step well back from the graph, basically what you see is a slowly rising levels of development until you hit the industrial revolution. Then it kind of explodes up hockey stick style, explodes up after that. But if you get in closer to the numbers, what you see is um, development will rise and rise and rise across millennia. And then it kind of sticks against what I call hard ceilings. And there's sort of a limit 
um, mm -hmm. to how far you can go within a given system of energy capture and organization of energy flows. And, and it's like you know, economists like to talk about all the different kinds of growth, like Smithian growth and Solovian growth, all these sorts of things. You can yeah. squeeze a lot out of, um, say, an agrarian system by Smithian growth, increasing efficiency in the organization of things, specialization of labor. It's so like the Romans and the Song. Yeah, exactly. And the Roman, the division of labor in the Roman Empire and Song Dynasty China, extremely sophisticated. And these guys were basically doing as much with agricultural economies, I think, as, as was humanly possible to do with them. But you, you get up to a certain level and then you're not going to go beyond that in terms of increasing development, increasing scale, increasing ability to exert your, your will on the world unless you solve the problems that are limiting your overall system. So like when hunter-gatherers developed basically as far as they could go, they could go no further until um, they had an agricultural revolution. The same with the agrarian societies. Get to a certain point, you can go no further until you have an industrial revolution. Crack the secret of fossil fuels, apply that to all your problems, um, and then it's possible to do all kinds of new things. But breaking those hard ceilings is very, very difficult. And um, when we're looking at, say, the, the prehistoric world and the hunter-gatherer societies, what you get is thousands upon thousands of separate natural experiments trying to figure out new ways to do things, of which the overwhelming majority of people did not figure out new ways to do things. Only in a few places, um, initially the Middle East, where the geography is most favourable to agriculture, only in those few places did they solve this problem. Then once they had, people around them had to start doing the same thing just to compete with them as their the farmer's wealth and numbers went up and up. When you're dealing with a threshold limiting the agrarian world, again, we see the Romans trying to solve these problems, not succeeding. Song Dynasty China in the 11th, 12th, 6th century don't succeed. By the 18th century, really everywhere from Western Europe to China, they're again pressing against that hard ceiling. Most of them, like the Ottoman Turkish Empire, Mughal, India, um, Qing Dynasty China, they don't figure out how to turn fossil fuels to solve mm -hmm. their problems. And um, only the Western Europeans do, again, you know, be because of their unique position. So say, you know, this is why um, Chinese seem to be doing so many things that are moving them toward an industrial revolution back a thousand years ago. But then... They, they they don't solve the problems. And I think it, it remains an open question why they don't solve the problems. I think that the, their relations with the steppe nomads and the constant invasions of northern China from the steppe, I think this has a lot to do with it. But yeah, this is something people, I think, will continue to argue about. But, but I think you're also arguing that, you know, if for some reason the East and the West were, were kept separate, right? In other mm -hmm. words, if this, if this development did not result in the ability to travel... <laughs> you know, very quickly, that sooner or later, the East would have presumably developed a lot of the same technologies that the West had. And and the only reason why the West wound up conquering the East, so to speak, is be just because of the, the speed, so that a very small temporal um, uh, gain could, could, you know, result in such a dramatic uh, disparity in power. Yes. Yeah, I think absolutely. I, the, I, you look back, say, the first agricultural societies that... Um, figure out how to domesticate plants and animals. This gives them an enormous advantage in numbers and increasingly in wealth. And they're able to invest a lot more in innovation. So they start their technology start racing ahead. Their military power starts pulling ahead. Enormous advantage over the societies right around them. But their ability to project power through space is pretty limited. And, you know, it's not a coincidence. You look at the biggest pre-modern empires, Roman Empire, um, various dynasties in China, uh, Persian empires, Turkish empires, they're all sort of in the same kind of ballpark for the maximum size they can reach because there are limits on what you can do to project power through space when you know, the fastest moving object in the world is a guy on the back of a horse. You know, there are certain limits to what you can do. But if you have an industrial revolution, suddenly those old limits are just blown away. And so the West, I don't think there's anything unique about Europeans in, in their ability to have an industrial revolution. Like you said, I think the Chinese definitely would have got there if they'd been left alone, but they were never going to be left alone. Once somebody in the world has had an industrial revolution, um, the Europeans go abruptly to be able to project power over the entire planet in this radically new way. And now, um, all of a sudden, you know, there's no possibility of anyone having the time 
in which to develop an indigenous autonomous industrial revolution once somebody has had one. The only question left now is, well, what are the rest of you going to do about it? Are you going to handle it really badly like the Chinese did? Or are you going to handle it really skillfully like the Japanese did? I think that just changes the nature of the problems. Yeah, because I guess the question is, why don't the technologies just flow uh, more quickly than than armies, right? Mm. So I, I guess this goes back to the debate over, you know, the, the Indo-Europeans and the spread of farming across Europe, right? Do you need to actually physically move with the technology or can the technology sort of, mm. you know, spread from from group to group? So so why why is it that the societies that have the more advanced technology, why, why isn't the technology just, just spread uh, with, without having to move the people and the armies and, and the political and military mm-hmm. might. Yeah, this is one of the oldest arguments in archaeology. Like when, when the field got started in the late 19th century, it fairly quickly became clear that a lot of the great changes in world history, like the beginning of agriculture, the beginning of cities, um, the, these things get invented first in one place and then they start showing up in other places so the big question was always well how did this happen um were say urbanization was this independently invented in multiple places or um like there was some 19th century guys who got they became known as the hyper diffusionists they became obsessed with this idea egypt had led the world in everything the egyptians invented everything and across the whole of the rest of the planet whenever you see writing or cities or metal or anything it was brought there by egyptians which pretty quickly became clear that was nuts but the the basic question hung around for a long time is it the movement of people is it a demographic process or are we dealing with um just purely cultural diffusion and people emulate each other or independently invent ideas and now um you know we now have this phenomenal new tool for addressing this which is ancient dna uh, which really has changed things dramatically and um the answer we've come up with is what you would probably have guessed without spending any of the money that we have done on all this, which is it, it's always it's a bit of both. Um, that certain <laughs> phenomena are heavily demographically driven, like like farming. Um, you know, we now can be pretty confident in the spread of farming out from the original heartlands. That's overwhelmingly driven by the way farming populations grow rapidly, become much denser than the hunter-gatherer populations around them. The farmers, you know, figure, hey, my field is getting smaller and smaller over the generations. Look at all these guys up there running around over the hills chasing antelopes. They don't need that land. And of course, this is a very common argument. European colonizers were still using this argument in the 19th century. They don't need that land. They're wasting it. I should have it. And as so many of us, we can just go there and take the land from them. And so farming populations will spread out. And um, one of the interesting things we now know is that hunter-gatherers on the whole are just are rarely very keen to take up farming for themselves. Mm. Um, it's not their goal in life is not to become farmers. It's to stop these guys stealing their land. The so farming seems to be heavily driven by demographic processes. But other things, I say metalworking. This definitely is in, invented independently in different places. Um, the idea can leap across long distances and be picked up somewhere else by a few merchants and spread it. So, yeah, we, it's becoming clear that the mechanisms of diffusion and the geographical expansion, these mechanisms are enormously varied and each case has got to be taken on its own merits. Well, I mean, one of the things you've also written about is cultural evolution. And and I guess, mm-hmm. you know, I think most people would would agree that cult, there's a complementarity between the... I guess the Marxian means of production and, and the culture. Um, but the, the debate is really over what's, what's driving what. And I guess there are some folks that would say that, you know, cultural change leads to economic and institutional change. And I think you'd be on the other side of that divide and, and say that, you know, it's the, the, the culture that flows from the means of production, specifically the, the type of, of energy capture. Uh, and, and you start the, the one of your books with this story where you were doing some field work in 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 Greece and and you ran into this uh, this peasant and and you realized that you thought very differently <laughs> about um, social norms and and uh, and of course I think that's that's a fairly frequent occurrence when people travel and we become increasingly aware of Western values Western norms or what's called you know weird uh, ways of thinking. But but you say that we shouldn't think of them as weird ways of thinking. We should think of them as as fossil fuel ways of thinking. So yeah. you're bringing your your fossil fuel values, not your Western values, but your fossil fuel values, 
so what, what do you mean by fossil fuel values? Tell us this, this, this story about uh, your encounter in Greece. Yeah, well, yeah, this, this encounter, this was just over 40 years ago when I was a graduate student. It's the first um, field work I'd done in Greece. And so I go out there, my Greek isn't all that good yet. So we're sitting around one evening after a day of field work, drinking out ouzo on the little veranda, this little house we've got for the, the dig house. And um, this old guy comes down the dirt road outside the dig house on the back of a donkey. And next to him, walking along next to the donkey and the old guy, is this old woman who's bent over almost double with this enormous sack of stuff on her back and yeah she's just struggling on to keep up the donkey and so one of our group of grad students spoke greek much better than any of the rest of us he gets up and he starts chatting away with this guy mr george his name is chatting away with mr george um talk for a minute comes back and sits down again so we'll say so what were you saying and he says oh i was just asking mr george how his day is going uh what he's doing and he's doing well they're fine and he thinks for a minute. And then he said, and then I asked him, so, so why are you on the donkey, Mr. George, while your wife is struggling with a great big sack? And Mr. George apparently looked at him, completely baffled, and said, well, she doesn't have a donkey. And it was just this mystifying moment for us all. This is this utterly different way of viewing the world from us. You know, back as a, a student at Birmingham University, you're back in Birmingham, if you'd acted that way, leaving your wife to carry the sack, everybody would have thought, well, they would have thought very badly of you. Let's, let's put it that way. And Mr. George clearly not only did not think badly of himself for behaving this way, but he was astonished that anyone else would think badly of him, or at least would, would question his behavior. And um, this, uh, it just seemed to me, this summed up a big historical cultural pattern that you can see when you start looking at the sources that survive, that um, our modern industrialized world, which we, we do tend to call Western, but I mean, like we were saying earlier with the geographical discussions, it, Western only in the sense that Western Europe was the place where it began. It's since then you know, begun to be globalized. Um, we live in a world that is, relatively speaking, pretty egalitarian, where gender barriers are very low, um, racial barriers compared to a lot of the world history are very low, all kinds of barriers are very low. This sort of image of society as being this place where people can move around to um, fulfill their abilities and are free to do whatever they want to do and to, to make themselves as prosperous as they want to be. Most of documented world history, though, has not been like that. Most agricultural societies based on the idea, very fixed roles. So some people are close to the gods and some are not. The ones who are close to the gods should be in charge, the others should not. Men and women are virtually different animals. You look at the literature of many ancient societies, they'll say men and women actually are different animals. People from different religions have no right to live unless we decide to allow them to do so. Slavery is absolutely natural and normal. And on it goes, it's very hierarchical, very rigidly divided world. And then you look at most hunter-gatherer societies. They tend to have more in common with modern Western societies than they do with medieval ones. And so it's this weird sort of pattern that we've got. And um, so I thought this was just this really interesting question. Why have societies been so different through time? Is it that humans are basically a blank slate? We could, anything can be written on our minds. Our values could be absolutely anything. Or is there some underlying pattern? And what I realized, because it's not, not that complicated once you start looking at it, is that um, in the society, the hunter-gatherer societies founded on gathering wild plants and hunting wild animals, um, these are societies, well, basically, cut a long story short, where egalitarian values work well. It's very difficult to run a hierarchical hunter-gatherer band. Can be done, but it's very, very difficult to do. In farming societies, if you just sort of don't have internal rules and regulations, it's very different for farming societies to flourish in that way. All the big farming societies in history have always been extremely hierarchical. And I think since the Industrial Revolution, we've moved into a world where um, the biological differences between male and female are just less important than they used to be. And so much of the work now, you know, you don't need to have huge broad shoulders to do a lot of the most important work now. Um, women are, like, through much of recorded history, women, most women spent most of their adult lives either pregnant or minding small children because they lived in you know, high birth, high uh, death rates, um, demographic regimes. Most women pregnant or with small children most of the time. Simply not the case case anymore. And so it seemed to me that there was a pretty direct flow from the ways of capturing energy to the 
methods you needed to, the, the, the way you needed to organize your society to take advantage of that, to the sorts of values that flourished. And of course, once you get into the details, it all starts to become a lot more complicated. But seen at the big scale, I think there is this definite sort of bottom up um, uh, causal link that really does explain the way human values have developed. Now, now, anthropologists um, oftentimes spend time simply trying to to understand it, and I think you, you're, you know, there's been this divide between the folks who want to understand and the folks who want to want to explain, and and it seems like you're 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 really trying to explain these ways of of looking at the world, to find some functionalism, right? Some 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 function behind the the beliefs that that if you subscribe to these beliefs, then you will be able to take full advantage of the the way in which value is created in that society, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are certain things that unite all human beings just as part of our biology. I think you, you can talk about such a thing as human nature. And I think part of human nature, uh, which is actually not that different from many other animal natures, is this idea of fairness, that we all want to be treated fairly. And I think this is something you find whether you're in a hunter-gatherer society or an uh, ancient farming society or in you know, modern California. Fairness is a, a fundamental human value and none of us like being treated unfairly. But what fairness and justice mean. I think these change dramatically over time. And uh, and I think, again, it comes down to some fairly simple things, in spite of all the variety out there, fairly simple proposition. Like one way of looking at fairness is to say, okay, people are pretty much all the same everywhere. We're biologically basically the same animal. So fairness, surely fairness consists of treating everybody the same. That is what fairness really is. Another way of looking at it, though, is saying, well, you know, people, everybody is different. We're all individuals. We're all different from each other. Treating us all the same way, that's not fair. In fact, that's completely unfair. And if, especially if you live in a society where some people are so rich, so powerful that they seem godlike, like they did, say, the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, mm -hmm. then treating everybody the same, that is about as far from being fair as you can possibly get. And so I think this is sort of the, the mechanism that li links the universal human values with the extremely culturally varied um, interpretations of human values. The, we all ask ourselves, what does fairness mean? What does justice mean? What should love look like? What is bravery? All the questions that Socrates asked in, in Plato's accounts of him. But in different sorts of societies, we come up with different answers. And I think those answers ultimately boil down to what is the most effective way to organize your society, to take advantage of the way it gets energy out of the environment. And we're all, it's not like God is not telling us to devise the most efficient moral systems. We're completely free to devise whatever moral systems we want. But if you devise an inefficient system of cultural values and you live next door to somebody whose system works much more efficiently, efficiently, they're going to steal all your food and kill you. And this, I think, is the mechanism that led to the diffusion of values across the world in different periods. Now, in, in both of those previous ways of capturing energy, we, we hit these hard ceilings. And, and I think you're, unlike many historians, you're not afraid to, to talk a bit about the history of the future, not just the past and, and the present. Um, are we headed towards another hard ceiling right now? I mean, are we running into the limits of what we can extract from our fossil fuel energy? Yeah, I think there's um, a really good chance that that's the case. Uh, I think if you, you look back at earlier times when uh, societies run up against the limits, one of the things you see is that um, they do tend to be quite aware that something is going terribly wrong. But uh, there's plenty of times in the past where people have not been running up against the limits where they also feel the same way. I think it's very hard when you're within a situation to be able to sort of look at it from the outside and understand, have we really run up against the limits of this way of extracting energy from the world? But certainly there are 
are a lot of signs that um, the older 19th, 20th century fossil fuel systems may have reached their limits. And one thing you do see whenever there is like a, a fundamental major breakdown in the social order, like you got, say, when the Romans or the Song Chinese ran up against the limits of what was possible in agrarian societies, you tend to get the same five problems emerging every single time in different combinations, but every time. And I call these in my book, I call them the five horsemen of the apocalypse. And these problems are, mm -hmm. you start to get massive population movements or massive by the standards of the day, bigger than any organizations of the day can control. As people are trying to move away from their problems, mobility has always been one of the options available to us when things start to go wrong. So massive movements of population that can't easily be controlled. Something that comes along with these massive movements of population every time there's been a great collapse in the past has been large-scale epidemic disease. People move from one zone to another, bringing their bugs with them to people who have not had time to develop the antibodies to handle these new bugs. The bugs get together and combine into various new forms, something we are intimately familiar with uh, as of 2020. Um, so, uh, so massive new epidemic diseases. The epidemic diseases, things like the Black Death or the Antonine Plague in the Roman Empire, these will sometimes carry off a quarter, a third, a half of the population. And when that happens, states start to collapse. Things break down. Um, and when the states break down, uh, food supply chains collapse with them, massive starvation sets in. Um, state failure normally triggers large-scale warfare as well. And then always in there, but in different ways, it different points in history, climate change has always been mixed in there somewhere with these other factors. And obviously, you don't need me to tell you, these are all problems that are very much in the news today. And so I think it's not out of uh, all reason to suggest that we perhaps really are pushing up against the limits of what a fossil fuel system can sustain. The population of 8 billion, um, the complexity of the interflows around the world, we're perhaps reaching the limits of what the, the 19th, 20th century system can possibly support. But, but it does seem that this this time it's, it's different, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the incentive to switch from hunter and gatherer to uh, agriculture was driven by uh, uh, the cost of, of hunting and gathering got very high, right? And uh, relative to uh, agriculture. And, and the same thing is true when we transition to using fossil fuels, where fossil fuels were so much cheaper than uh, um, animal and, and human energy. But, but it's, it's not as if the price of fossil fuels is, is rising to prohibitive levels. It seems like the, the global warming is going to impact us before fossil fuels become prohibitively expensive. Yeah, I guess I suppose it depends how you, you think about price. I mean, if you price in the environmental costs of using fossil fuels, I think we would have to say that the price of fossil fuels has actually become extremely high. And that I think is you But that's but that's a collect that's a that would be a collective price, right? So it's not a price exactly, that's borne yes, by the, yes. the, the individual yes. decision maker. It was often the case in the past as well that um, the the price of say that the price of overhunting uh, a, a region is something that's borne by everybody around there. Um, whereas you know if you can kill that one last antelope, even if it's a pregnant female antelope, uh, maybe you're going to do it if the alternative is your family starves tomorrow. But the price for everybody else of you killing that last antelope is really really high. I think the the challenge for us now, as it often has been in the past, is do the institutions that we have created in order to solve the problems of our previous um, energy systems, do those in institutions have the flexibility to allow us to develop alternative ways of doing things? Or um, is the pursuit of individual gain going to override uh, a growing awareness that we do have a collective problem to solve? But I also think our problem now with the fossil fuel crisis, I mean, if, if we're right to diagnose this as the problem, our problem now is different from the sorts of problems they had when uh, fossil fuels were first being understood and when agriculture was first being implemented. Because like, you go back into the past and look at these um, hunting and gathering to farming and farming to fossil fuel transitions. They all played out through multiple natural experiments going on in, in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's possible to fail over and over again. 
Um, certainly with the origin of farming and you know, with, with the fossil fuels, you certainly got five or six cases where we can say, oh, people seem to be moving in that direction, but then kind of don't get there until you get to 18th century England. So it's possible to have a regional failure in these earlier experiments. Now we're in a world where it's kind of not possible to have a regional failure anymore. We're looking at a global scale challenge where if we don't somehow solve the problem that we've created by using the fossil fuels, the entire planet potentially could get sucked down into this vortex. And then the other thing that I think makes it different from the past is um, one of the many, many amazing uses we found for the, all this energy we were tapping into in the 20th century was nuclear weapons. And nobody had um, a tool like this in the past. You know, I think if, if the Roman Empire had had nuclear weapons, they would certainly have used them. They, they were the kind of guys who would definitely mm-hmm. use the bomb. Um, yeah, we Caesar would have definitely used them. Oh, oh, yeah, no hesitation whatsoever. But, um, so we're in a world where yeah, we've got these global scale problems that are increasingly difficult to solve, uh, that it can look tempting sometimes, as we've seen recently, to use violence to solve your problem on a local scale. We live, though, also in a world where a number of nations have nuclear weapons. Um, and I, again, I don't think I've got to be a total pessimist to think, surely there will eventually come a problem where some nuclear armed world leader is going to say using these nuclear weapons is not the worst scenario on the table for me or at least i'm willing to take a chance that it's not the worst scenario on the table for me and i think once we start down that path i mean i I, you know i'm sure you know about all this stuff in one of the the great discoveries that the rand corporation made when it would play these war games of simulating uh, the outbreak of nuclear war and trying to manage nuclear war is that it didn't matter who they brought in as the players in these games everybody ended up going to total nuclear war within the first few rounds of the game. I and mean, it's just like, like Klaus Fitz, so it's very difficult to stop the move toward total war once you start it. And so that, of course, that makes our experiment, if you want to put it in that language, so different from the earlier ones. We, you know, even the, the good news is, you know, there's only for every um, 10 nuclear weapons in the world in the 1980s is now only one. This is great. This is one of the best things that's ever happened in history. But we're now starting to build them again. And we are moving back to a world where we can destroy the entire planet in a few days if we choose to do so. And that really focuses the mind. This makes our situation unique. Now, if you're writing this book, uh, um, Foragers, Farmers, and Fossil Fuels a Thousand Years From Now, would would there be a, an additional chapter on, say, solar? I mean, are we moving to a a fourth uh, phase in this energy capture um, history? And and if so, it, it doesn't seem like solar would result in the same kinds of changes to our culture and and beliefs and and values as the the other transitions. Uh, it seems it seems like it's 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 just an extension of the the current system of organizing society yeah I mean, this is obviously a really interesting question to ask when you you're writing books of this sort you can't you know, keep your mind off these questions and obviously I, I would be totally delighted if anyone is reading my books in a thousand years time but i don't think reading books is going to be what they're doing in a thousand years time um but uh yeah uh <laughs> w- w- one thing y- it's very striking when you look back at the big energy transitions in the past, because the one we can see most clearly is the farming to fossil fuels transition, is how nobody really saw this coming or understood what was happening, where this was going to go. And certainly you know, the pioneers of fossil fuels in late 18th century um, England, they had no idea what fossil fuels were going to do to English society. And I'm pretty certain James Watt would have been horrified if you'd stopped him and told him, this is going to usher in democracy and sexual equality and the end of this, that and the other, undermine the Christian church. People would have been horrified at this. But on the whole, they did not see this coming. And I'm pretty sure this is the same now, that we don't see this coming. And we we can guess about it. And one thing I got really into while I was writing Why the West Rules for Now was reading old science fiction from the 19th century. Where did they <laughs> think things were going? It's wonderful. <laughs> Seeing we are, what a guy like Charles Verne or H.G. Wells, what they foresaw that they were more or less right about. Then the incredibly <laughs> funny stuff that they absolutely failed to foresee. And so I'm sure our attempts to foresee where we're going will be rather similar. But I do think there's enough hints out that you can construct a story, even if that's ended up 
to be all it is. Construct a story about how um, the new energy sources really are fundamentally transforming everything about human values. And uh, one of the obvious things that's going on is the kind of transformation of what it means to be a human being that we've been going through now for a couple of hundred years through medical interventions, you know, pharmacological interventions, and increasingly, I would say, through you know, genetic and digital interventions. We, uh, we've already, in the last hundred years, we've changed what it means to be a human more than happened in the previous hundred thousand years. And people, you know, people from our great-grandparents' generation would be astonished astonished that you know, a couple of old duffers like you and me can still have a reasonable conversation at our ages. We've still got um, you know, most of our teeth and we can get up and run around and all kinds of things. <laughs> we just change our bodies so much. But I think this is absolutely just the beginning. And again, you don't have to be a nutty Silicon Valley futurist to think that well before the next hundred years are up, we're going to have something along the lines of telepathy. We're going to have something along the lines of the interlinking of all the human intelligence in the world. I mean, maybe it won't be Ray Kurzweil's vision of kind of beaming up our uh, intellect onto some great database in the sky. But this is where things are going. We already have experiments where rats in North America are controlled controlling the brains of rats in South America over the internet and making them do things in their cages. Mm -hmm. you know, we're living in this magical new world. And um, increasingly already, life for a lot of people in the wealthier parts of the world is being transferred onto a sort of digital platform. We're living in different ways from people in the past. And we're able to do that because we consume so much more energy than they have in the past, running a world digital platform. This is a phenomenally energy-heavy enterprise, which is not going to be possible if we continue on a fossil fuel regime. That, I think, most people can now agree on. It's only possible if we move into new energy sources that don't kind of burn the planet around us. And I think one of the things, I do think there's a connection here, that one of the things you see now, which I think has changed dramatically from even 30 years ago, when you talk to students, and young people, is the increasing emphasis on new ideas about social justice and sharing of things, as opposed to these wicked ideas that old people like me have about this. And uh, a number of the computer guys I've talked to do link this very much to the the effect of living on a digital platform, the merging mm. of ideas, things which are just different from what we do in normal life. My guess would be that we're going to see a completely different idea of what it is to be an individual emerging out of the technological revolution that we're going through now. But having said that, I do recognize that everyone who's ever predicted the future in the past was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So there is at least a possibility I might be mistaken too. I think that's one of the reasons why when you uh, came up with the four factor development index, uh, information technology was, was one of the four. And, mm -hmm. and while the, the, the means of energy capture seems to been the most important of those four variables for most of human history, it may well be that the information technology factor is, is going to be the more determinative one. And so maybe when you rewrite this book in a thousand years, uh, the fourth thing will be foragers, farmers, fossil fuels, and, and, and machine learning or something like that. So, yes. Well, Ian, thank, thanks so much for joining me. This has been fantastic. I'm sure we could talk forever. Uh, I didn't even mention this new book, Ge Geography is Destiny, which introduces us to the original Brexit and, and also the original um, European Union, <laughs> which was, I think, back when the Danes and, and the, the the Norwegians and the Angles and the Saxons were all kind of sailing around the, the North Sea. You know, you wrote this book, um, I guess, as as a response to 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 Brexit. And I think at the beginning of the book, you talk about the the Thatcher question, which is, you know, is it or is it not part of Europe? Is Britain part mm -hmm. of Europe? And and I think that it's an extension of what you were uh, one of the points that you're making in uh, Why the West Rules, which is that. At some point, it became inevitable that, that Europe was going to be the locus of this this dramatic revolution. But it, but it wasn't necessarily inevitable that it was going to be England, right? And necessarily yes. centered in on where you're from, right? And Stoke-on-Trent, which is the the epicenter of where all all of this happened. Um, do you do you think that the do you think that English people their their self conception is in some part, a function of the them being first in in so many ways, both with this industrial revolution and ultimately 
right? As you mentioned in the book, having so much of the map being pink back in the 1950s and and so on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I wrote do, this book. Do you think people understand the 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 act? Do people understand the contingency of of the mm. the English uh, experience? Well, yeah, yeah. I, I I wrote this book, Geography is Destiny, um, because you know I. Been, I decided to write it seven, eight years ago. I, I, I've been by this point, I've been writing these books, scaling up to the global level and thousands and millions of years of history. Been spending several years writing these books and having a really good time. But uh, all the time I was writing them, there's like this little nagging voice in my head saying, "Well, you know, this is not really what historians do. You know, we try to explain actual, concrete things that happened um, in real lives in one particular place, and all these grand theories you're coming up with, you know, they're not worth the pixels they're written in unless they can actually scale down." to explain a specific thing that happens in some time and place. And so I was thinking for several years, I think, you know, I need to write a book doing this, like turning the telescope around, zooming into a particular place. And I was thinking originally, maybe I would write it about Greece, because that was where I began my academic career, working on the ancient Greeks. But then in 2016, I wake up one morning and discover that my, my former countrymen in the British Isles, in their wisdom, have decided to leave the European Union. And I immediately thought, oh, of course, this is the perfect test case. Here's a concrete things that happened. Can my long-term global scale approach help me understand what just happened? And I actually, I, I think it really did. Um, that you know, like a lot of uh, my sort of people, um, you know, I say, obviously, you know, I, I'm an academic. I have migrated to the other side of the world. I, um, at least before COVID, used to jump on airplanes, going places all the time. Um, you know, I, like a lot of my sort of people, I was horrified by this vote to leave the European Union. It just seemed to me that, um, you know, that a bad idea to the point of being inexplicably stupid. But then when I started looking more seriously into British history, you know, like, I, like a lot of people, I, I grew up in Britain, went to school there. I thought I knew something about British history. But as I started working on it seriously, I realized you know, not only do I not know much about British history, but the bits that I think I do know, I've actually got completely wrong. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that what happened in 2016, the Brexit vote, while I still do think it was a mistake, it was an explicable mistake. And with Britain, there's this long-term um, tension within the way people in the British Isles approach the rest of the world. And what is going to be our best way to deal with the rest of the world? Because the centres of wealth and power and social development had um, throughout most of history have been off to the south and east, the Mediterranean, Middle East, India, China, and so on. Stuff, basically stuff got invented there and rolled downhill until it ended up in the British Isles. And the question in Britain was always, what do we do about this? And if you lived in what became England, the south and east of the Isles, your question was, what do we do about the continent? If you lived in Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, the north and the west, your question was, what do we do about England? Because you know, the south and the east is where mm -hmm. problem, opportunities and problems constantly come from. Um, and there seemed to be really two big solutions have been thought up through during history one of them was kind of we 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 embrace the wealth and power and sophistication of the south and east we lean toward europe try to be one with europe and and that is the way to to maximize our utility to put it in economic speak the other answer was we lean away from europe we cut ourselves off from the europeans as much as we can we try to pursue our own world and that's the way we maximize our utility and really Almost the whole of the 10,000 year story. It's a 10,000 year story because it's about 10,000 years ago that rising waters after the end of the ice age as the glaciers melt, that cuts what become the British Isles off from Europe. And so that this is when the question becomes recognizable in modern terms. Through almost the whole of that 10,000 years, the British really had no choice but to lean toward Europe because there was no way to stop the Europeans coming to Britain. The English Channel was really it's like a highway, not a barrier. Um, and so the question was always, well, how do we lean toward Europe? Who benefits from this? How do we nuance this relationship? But then it's really uh, beginning about 500 years ago, 
technology and organization have changed in ways such that governments based in London, if they want to, they can cut England off from the Europeans. They can control the English channel in the sense of denying its use to other people. And one option, it seems to them, is we could cut ourselves off from Europe and then secure behind what Shakespeare, who kind of lives through the period when this becomes possible, Shakespeare called the moat defence. Secure behind a moat defensive, we can unite the whole of the British Isles into a single kingdom under control from London, expand our tentacles across the Atlantic, and basically um, move from being bit players on a European stage to being the star on a global stage. And um, this is a, a very contested idea in England. They fight a civil war over it. Terrible things happen. But by 1700, the people running the country have recognised, yeah, this is the way to go. They move Britain in this direction. Britain creates an empire on which the sun never sets. But then by 1900, geography is changing its meanings again, technology and organisation changing again. It is no longer possible in the 20th century for Britain to maintain this sort of global stage with Britain as the main actor. And this, um, I would say, this is where the Brexit question comes out of. This debate that in a way the debate goes back to 1900, but it really takes off in the 1950s. Um, Britain can no longer dominate the global stage. The very best outcome we found so far has been to be like a second tier actor following an American lead. This is the least bad outcome for the British Isles. Going forward toward the end of the 20th century, is this still the least bad outcome? Or would it be better to lean back toward Europe? And if we do that, can we maintain the American connection? And what about this Commonwealth we've built up, uh, these English speaking nations, the Australians and New Zealanders? Um, can we, uh, Canadians, of course, can we continue to work with them? Can we keep a special place for Britain? So this, this was really what the argument was about. Uh, what is the best place for the British Isles on the global stage? Now that the centre has shifted toward America, and particularly though now that the centre is beginning to shift toward China, what is going to be the best position moving forward? And I think that the mistake people made in 2016 was to think that that question is actually about Britain's relations with Europe which I think is a legacy of the previous 10,000 years of history, not understanding the question. The question wasn't about Brussels. The question was actually about Beijing. And I think historians of the future, when they look back at Brexit, what they ask themselves is, was this a plus or a minus in figuring out a new relationship for the British Isles in a world increasingly dominated by China? So, so yeah, I went off on a bit of a rant there, but that was kind of what the, the new book was about. Mm -hmm. Well, when you wrote the book, um, Why the West Rules for Now, I think you were very um, optimistic about China's chances uh, for catching up with the, mm -hmm. the West fairly soon. I, I think since then, I think some people would uh, say that perhaps it was a bit too optimistic, um, that things have not advanced as quickly as perhaps some people thought, uh, and mm -hmm. that Chimerica seems to be fracturing somewhat without necessarily the, the the dire consequences that, that you might have anticipated um mm -hmm. do, do you think that the chinese institutions necessarily um impede the, the development of chinese technical progress is there is there anything that, but does china because people talk about a chinese version of 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 capitalism a chinese version of uh social organization but but i think your argument is that there, there really is uh convergence and if convergence is, is impeded it may it may be an impediment to to development yeah yeah well back when i was writing why the west rules for now which came out in 2010 um that was the days when george w bush was running around saying things like trade with china and time is on our side and there's a lot of social scientific thought mm -hmm. was saying that you know, the only way to succeed in a capitalist market-based economy is by liberalizing your institutions and becoming more and more like the West. And in the two, in the decade of the 2000s, I mean, there, were, there were a number of signs that maybe that was right. You know, you look at places like Hong Kong, South Korea, um, you know, they, they start off as pretty nasty one-party states and gradually move more and more toward democracy. But then by the time Why the West Rules came out in 2010, it was already, <laughs> over the previous few months before the book came out, it was already starting to become clear, oh, this apparently is not the way the Chinese leadership sees this situation. Um, they... Mm -hmm. 
appear to think that the global financial crisis has meant that can it, the West is done now. This is the time to become much more assertive as China and push your way to the front of the global stage. And I must say, I think they have made a terrible mistake in doing that. Uh, I think that what was happening before 2009, um, China's wealth and influence around the world was growing and growing. And um, I think there's I mean, not, very few things in history are inevitable. I think there's always going to be a high chance there would be some sort of confrontation between the US and China. But back around 2006, 2007, this looked like this was a long way off and there was no reason to think it might be a military confrontation. So I think that the Chinese leadership has made a terrible mistake in, in rushing this process and um, potentially bringing us to the, the brink of uh, brink of some kind of nuclear war between the two countries, which obviously would be tragic for everybody. And I think they've also made a mistake in thinking that uh, that you, you can accommodate a global um a global market order within a very, very top-down hierarchical sort of communist uh, institutional system. Um, and again, who knows whether I'm right in thinking those things, because the, the, my thinking about this has these disturbing parallels with the way a lot of people in the late 18th century wrote about this new market-based order that was emerging then. Um, they, they couldn't believe that it could possibly be run in a different way from the aristocratic societies that they were used to. And I think you, know, you look at the 19th and 20th centuries, market based basically free societies really won on every front when they confronted autocratic societies but of course what if the chinese are right what if the world is now changing so much that that is ceasing to be the case um and i do think that the law if i'm right about the way i look at history you know, the logic of this is you get this evolutionary competition going on between different ways of doing things and if the chinese top-down hierarchical system does turn about out to be a more efficient way to run the new kind of world that's emerging in the 21st century, then like it or not, this is the way the rest of the world is going to go. And you know, I have my, I have my views on which I think is right, where the world is going to go. But uh, again, one of the things I think I've learned from doing all this history is you've got to be ready to be wrong. Well, Ian, thank you so much for joining me. These books, again, the most recent is Geography is, is Destiny. I think uh, you, what you what you bring to the table is the the ambition of the big historians like Toynbee and and Gibbons and 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 Hume and Churchill, but you but along with uh, with social science insight from archaeology, sociology, even biology and geography. So thanks so much. Hope to chat again soon. Well, thanks so much for having me on the podcast and for putting me in that company there at the end. That would be a good place to be. This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 